Hello, future professional engineers. This is Vasim Asghar. I'm a licensed PE in the US and Canada. I've authored several books on the topic of FE electrical and computer exam, as well as a PE power exam. And I run popular exam preparation programs for FE electrical and PE power. In this video, you're gonna see me doing a strategic overview of section number nine, electronics, which is one of the big five topics on the FE electrical and computer exam. It is an extract from a live training session that I did with my FE electrical and computer students. I will go over all the knowledge areas within electronics that form part of the latest NCE FE electrical and computer exam specification. One of the things that you need to remember about electronics is that it is essentially circuit analysis on steroids. About 70%, maybe up to 80% of electronics is based on circuit analysis and the remaining 20 to 30% is where the device specific knowledge of diodes, zener diodes, p-n junction diodes, operational amplifiers, transistors in the form of BJTs. BJTs are further divided into PNP, NPN. Then we have the MOSFETs, which is another class of transistors. They're further divided into NMOS, PMOS. Then we have JFETs. Then we have power electronics. So all of these knowledge pieces within electronics are essentially specialized concepts, theories, and domains which basically ride on top of circuit analysis. That's why I tell my students to pay special attention to circuit analysis. In fact, throughout this live training session in which I solved several practice problems, I took real time questions from students. One of the recurring themes was circuit analysis because a student may have a decent understanding of op amps or transistors or diodes, but if they are shaky when it comes to circuit analysis, nothing else will matter because you cannot go about finding the Q point of a transistor if you cannot solve a circuit. You may have a decent understanding of how to approach a transistor. What are the regions of operation for a transistor? What are the different biasing that you have to worry about? What are the different regions of operation of a transistor? What does amplification mode do? What does the cutoff mode do? What is a linear region? But if you're not able to figure out the key currents and voltages in a transistor circuit or a diode circuit, you won't be able to progress far. If you're new to this channel, please consider subscribing to the channel to stay up to date with the weekly content that I publish for FE Electrical as well as a P Power exam preparation. And if you have any comments, feel free to ask me questions and even suggestions for future videos. Without further ado, let's dive into the strategic overview of electronics. So let me do a quick review of um, electronics, okay? So what have we learned about electronics? Electronics is, I don't think that any one of the students, and I go through multiple rounds of live training with my students every year, okay? Electronics along with digital systems to an extent circuit analysis, can probably be thrown in the same basket is one of the two biggest and the most difficult topics that students find uh, to, while they're preparing for the FE electrical and computer exam. So there are pieces within electronics, components within electronics that are easier than others. As you go through my on-demand program, you guys have realized that I actually deal with semiconductor fundamentals as part of electronics. If you look at the NCS specification in the reference handbook and even in the exam specification, they include semiconductor fundamentals as a line item within properties of electrical materials. But I think that semiconductor fundamentals flow really nicely within electronics. Uh, the discussion around built-in potential, the discussion around conductivity, thermal voltage, carrier concentration, it is more relevant to electronics than it is to properties of electrical materials, okay? So the only thing that you have to really worry about, in my opinion, when it comes to uh, semiconductor fundamentals is the fact that the units of measurement are a little bit convoluted. There are squares, okay? Um, you, uh, they sometimes use, uh, actually, Boltzmann constant, for example. The unit for Boltzmann constant is not very intuitive. So you need to be very careful what the unit of measurements are, right? If it's meters, millimeters, uh, centimeters, okay? And you need to handle the prefixes properly. And the other thing is that 
these quantities can be very large or very small, 10 to the power of 20 or 10 to the power of minus 22. The charge on an electron is what? 1.602 multiplied by 10 raised to the power of minus 19 coulombs, right? So handling the units of measurement and these powers can be tricky. So please pay special attention to it. In the course, I've gone through it in a lot of detail, multiple quiz problems in the homework assignments in the study guide. So please make sure you get your hands dirty with it. Diodes. In the reference handbook, they talk about the junction diode. They talk about the Zener diode. They talk about the ideal model. They talk about Shockley equation. So for a simple, straightforward topic like diode, all these three different categories that we're looking at can actually create unique scenarios, questions, and problems, okay? So you need to have a very good understanding of what forward biasing means for a diode, what reverse biasing means, how is a Zena diode different from a junction diode? What is the typical mode of operation for a Zena diode? Reverse biasing, right? Voltage clamping, what are the applications? All of these things with practice problems, explanations, and theoretical discussions, I've detailed them out within the program. CVD model, unless mentioned otherwise, you always assume the voltage drop of what? When you're dealing with diodes, 0.7. Unless mentioned otherwise, you are going to always assume it as 0 0.7. And sometimes a straightforward diode analysis can be tricky because of the CVD model. The other thing that you have to worry about when it comes to diodes, especially when you have multiple diodes, is your assumptions, right? So it's a trial and error. In my opinion, a question involving more than three diodes is just too much for a three minute per question on the exam, okay? But within the program, we have multiple practice problems where we work through three, even four diodes, okay? So please make sure that you systematically work through the assumptions, do the circuit analysis, and you know, and, and you equip yourself with the knowledge of how to actually test those assumptions and the final results. Shockley's equation, pretty simple, straightforward, is basically the nonlinear model. The equation is given in the reference handbook. So that's diodes. Then we have operational amplifiers, right? What are the key things I told you for operational amplifiers within the program and during today's discussion? That V plus is equal to V minus for an ideal operational amplifier. That is the voltage that appears at the positive terminal is the same voltage that is gonna appear on the negative terminal. And the input current is always equal to zero because the resistance is infinite, okay? And that is basically it. Combine this with KCL and you will be able to solve practically all ideal op-amp problems, okay? Very quickly and very efficiently. Now the reference handbook contains these um, diagrams and these uh, equations for inverting and non-inverting. As easy and simple and helpful as they appear, they are very limited in application because those equations can directly be used only when the op-amps are configured in those configurations, okay? And if I make any modification to the resistors, the placement of the resistors and the voltages, then it is no longer an inverting or a non-inverting. It can be something else, right? But the KCL with the V plus is equal to V minus, input resistance is equal to infinite, will always help you get the right result, okay? Then there's also the concept related to CMRR, a CMRR, and we have some practice problems related to that in the program. Then we have the BJTs. BJTs and MOSFETs are probably the two most um, demanding um, sections of electronics because each one of them has spin-offs, right? You have the NPN and PNP when it, come to B, it comes to BJT, and you have the NMOS and the PMOS when it comes to the MOSFETs. Now there's a lot of overlap between them, right? And uh, the overlap is in the form that they have these two categories, PNP and PN and MOS, PMOS, regions of operation as well. Both are transistors at the end of the day, right? They're two junction devices, right? Um, in fact, bipolar junction transistors. And both of them, regardless of you know how you look at the names, have three states. One is doing amplification, the other state is doing linear operation, right? Which is basically switch closed. And the third one is switch open or the cutoff in both BJTs as well as the MOSFETs. Now, the saturation of MOSFET is basically the active of BJT. 
The other similarities, I've done side-by-side -side comparison in my on-demand course, how the base is similar to the gate and so on. Um, IB, the base current is very low when it comes to BJT. In MOSFETs, the gate current is always equal to zero. And we, we can actually exploit some of these facts, right? Uh, in our circuit analysis, as we have seen throughout the course while doing the practice problems. Now, the key thing when it comes to these BJTs and MOSFETs that will help you immensely is a systematic, methodic, algorithmic approach in solving these circuits, okay? If you look at these circuits um, and, and try and do multiple things at the same time, you will get overwhelmed, right? Uh, students do get overwhelmed. In the course, I've given you a step-wise process. Step number one, identify whether you're given a NPN or a PNP. Right? In the case of MOSFET, identify whether you're given a NMOS or a PMOS. Step number two is to rule out cutoff. Okay, If you can rule out cutoff based on the biasing, then the next best assumption is always amplification, which is active region for BJTs and which is saturation for MOSFET. Okay, And Within amplification, once you assume that you're operating in amplification, when it comes to BJT, we have VBE is equal to 0 0.7 or VEB is equal to 0 0.7 if you're dealing with the PNP. You enforce these conditions and then in a stepwise manner, you evaluate it. And the final step is to actually check your assumptions. A lot of students don't take this methodical approach, right? They've never learned transistor analysis in this manner. And that's why transistor analysis always remains one of those scary topics for them, always, okay? The reference handbook does a decent job. I'm not gonna say that it's perfect because as we know that both for BJTs as well as for MOSFET, they have provided you the conditions, regions of operations, circuit diagrams, current directions, only for NPN and NMOS respectively. For PNP and PMOS, they've simply said, Current directions are operate, opposite, voltage polarities are flipped, right? And within the coursework, I've given you a systematic approach as to what that would translate into in terms of the biasing. So please spend a little bit extra time. In my opinion, what I've seen students do, and which I think is fair, uh, they end up spending 50% of their time within electronics on BJT and MOSFETs, okay? If you find yourself doing that, I don't think you are too off, too much off the mark. All right, this is very, very standard because these are two very big components. Uh, JFETs are basically an extension of MOSFETs. Um, um, the MOSFETs that we talk about without describing in detail are enhancement mode, right? Where amplification happens. JFETs are similar to depletion mode MOSFETs. I briefly talked about them in the course. And JFETs are not primarily used for amplification purposes. I have three lectures on JFETs, right? I have additional practice problems that I've done for JFETs. Um, conditions of operation and whatnot, they're used as variable resistors. By changing the voltages that are applied, we can actually change the effective resistance of a JFAT. We can inject a JFAT in a circuit and then control the overall current of the circuit uh, electronically by changing the voltages. That's basically the advantage. Then we have instrumentation. A lot of students forget that instrumentation portion of electronics is not under the bookmark on the reference handbook. Uh, under electrical and computer engineering, okay? I make it very clear in my course, I cross-reference the reference handbook page numbers. So guys, please make sure that for instrumentation related topics such as Wheatstone bridge, RTDs, thermistors, transducers, and so on, you step out of the electrical and computer engineering section and go to the instrumentation section. Does it make sense? For the most part, these are pretty simple, but as you've seen in the homework assignment, uh, I made some really challenging questions out of fairly simple concepts. And that is typical. You can have a very easy section presenting you with extremely difficult questions. And you can also have an extremely complicated section presenting you with some popcorn questions on the exam. So be ready for everything, okay? Power electronics. So the power electronics within FE electrical is actually extremely simple when compared to power electronics that you are hopefully gonna encounter very soon in the PE power program and the PE power exam, 
Power electronics on the P power exam is one of the top three most difficult topics to prepare for and one of the most difficult topics potentially on the exam. Because what you see for bug converter, boost converter, bug boost converter, even rectifier, is a tip of the iceberg in FE electrical. They've given you those equations in the form of duty cycles and number of pulses and whatnot, right? And that's basically it. So as long as you understand the concept of duty cycle, in my opinion, and are able to utilize the right equations, you should be fine. But within my program, as you know, I've gone in a lot more detail. I've actually created those circuits. I've explained you the graphics uh, from, from a graphical standpoint, from a mathematical standpoint, from a circuit operation standpoint. And this is really to prime you for the, uh, for the P power. Because when it comes to P power, each one of these circuits we analyze in a lot of depth, okay? And, uh, but in the context of FE electrical, this is one of the easy pickings. So when you take a step back and look at electronics, I would say that 70%, and I've repeated this several times now, 70% of your electronics is simply circuit analysis. The remaining 30%, you just have to add a layer of diodes. You have to add a layer of op amps, BJT conditions, MOSFET specific uh, understanding, okay? And that's basically it. Within my program, I have over 100 practice problems when you look at it for electronics, on-demand content. Every single lecture, I'm doing at least two to three, five problems sometimes. Uh, then I have additional uh, practice problem lectures that I have for some of these big hitters, BJTs, MOSFETs, or op amps. After every single lecture, for the most part, you have quizzes. Each quiz has about five to 10 practice problems. Then you have a mini exam at the end right? Study guide problem sets, homework assignments. I think for the electronics one and electronics two, we had 15 a piece, right? About 30 practice problems, if not more. I'm forgetting what exactly the count was. So when you combine it together, you have 100 high quality practice problems to work with. But just working through the practice problems is not going to be enough. You need to really have a solid understanding of circuit analysis and device specific knowledge for electronics to basically deliver a knockout punch on the exam for section number nine. Make sense? I hope you guys found this summary helpful. And uh, if you're still working on electronics uh, and moving into the next week, which is power systems, I would suggest that, you know, button it up to a point where you can pick it up because when we advance into, uh, you know, week six, seven, and eight, you will have the opportunity to come back to it. If you like this video, then please don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Feel free to ask me any questions in the comment section of this video below. You can find tons of success stories of my FE Electrical and P Power students over here. And if you want to learn more about preparation of FE Electrical and Computer Exam and the P Power Exam, then check out these playlists over here. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon in the next video.